Today's May 5th, 2018. I'm Brad Brown, and I'm here to interview my mother, Jean McLeaf Brown, on the business places that existed here in Tawnytown back in the 1930s and 1940s. And, uh, Jean, tell us a little bit about... Well, I wanted to say, too, that I'm Jean McLeaf Brown. I moved to Tawnytown January the 1st, 1936, and I'm 92 years old, well really, 92 and a third as of today. So let's go ahead and we'll take we'll our walk down East Baltimore Street. Yeah, we'll start at your, your home place, it's at uh, 428 East Baltimore Street back then. And uh, as you're walking towards town, uh, what would be some of the businesses that you would pass? Well, the first one would be C.O. Fuss and Sons Funeral Parlor and Furniture Store. And it was not C.O. Fuss when, well, it was still named that, but Mervyn Fuss, his son, was running the business then. And the funeral parlor was to your left entrance, and the furniture store was to the right, and it was a two-story furniture store very nice line of furniture with name brands and my husband and I bought our first breakfast set there in the late 40s. Very good, very good. And behind that was a business as right well? Right behind that was the Tony Town Grain and Supply and then right next on East Baller Street, the Green and, Tony Town Grain and Supply was really on Mill Avenue, but it was very visible from Baltimore Street. And the next was Rheindollers Grain and Supply. Both similar businesses, but both did very well. And the Tony Town Grain and Supply went several decades beyond the 1940s. I see. And in close proximity to that location was the, uh, the train station? Pennsylvania train station, which fortunately is still in our town on the corner of East Baltimore and George Street in the yard of the Hans Crow home. But this was a passenger train and a freight train and our mail train. I see. And yeah. Mr. Tom Tracy was the post, I mean, the train ma master. Very good. And the mail got delivered in a big wooden crude looking cart that Mr. John Flegel would meet the train every day with the mail going out and he and Mr. Tracy would load the trade in. Mr. Flegel was a very slightly built man, and the wheels on that cart came almost to his shoulder. You had to wonder how such a slightly built person could push that heavy cart full of mail up the street to the post office. That's quite a task. It sure really was. Very good. And what was next along the, along the route? Well, right next to the train station was Jack Moore's Beer Parlor and Restaurant. And it was not what you would call a family style restaurant. We said that place would get a little rough and rowdy, especially Saturday evening when the crowds came to town. Okay. And then uh, what was next along the way around? Uh, the the next business was Dr. Dern, the dentist and his home, and that was right opposite Middle Street. As you come down Middle Street, you'd be facing right into the brick house. Okay, very good. And then um, after that would be like an economy store? That was, yes, uh, Dave Smith ran the economy store. And back then you called those stores general stores because it had women, men's clothing, some shoes and linens and sewing supplies and just most anything that you need in your home sometime which we don't have or never I haven't seen in years table oil cloth and he'd have that by the yard hmm. and was there a similar store right next to that and then it was one house 
in between his and Milk Kraus, mm -hmm. which also was the same type of merchandise, except Mr. Kraus had a corner in the back of his store that drew the young people because it was games and card games like gold maids, dominoes, checkers, coloring books. It was just a little nook that the young people congregated there. Very good. And then uh, after making your way through town, it was a barbershop? And next was Toby Brown's barbershop. And he dealt in some lawn equipment. Not much, but he later moved out where now PNC Bank is, and he built his building out there and extended his lawn equipment. Very good. And then along the route, was there a grocery store that you and came about? It was the American Grocery Store, and that was a big chain back then, and it was very popular. People loved it, but it didn't stay very long. And one unique thing there that people never saw before was the first electrical coffee grinder. You get your beans and then state how you would like them ground and they fulfilled your wishes. Didn't have to crank it by hand. Yeah. And I didn't know, of course, who worked there. It was like straight, almost all strangers. Mm -hmm. All right. And, uh, was there a hardware store nearby? Well, we had the Ryan Dollar Hardware Store, which was certainly a family-run store. We had Wallace, his brother Harry, Harry's son Henry, and way early it was a sister there named Mary. And later, when Wallace and Harry were deceased, there was Henry and his mother, Isabel, did a lot of clerking in that store. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, was a doctor's office? Then we had Dr. Benner. He was a family doctor. He did home calls. He did baby delivery in Tawny Town. And that was when you didn't make an appointment with Dr. Benner. He had his iris posted on the door. And if you had an ailment, you went in, and at the appointed time, he would make his appearance and say, who came first? And that person would get up, and we just kept going. And once in a while, he'd come with his little black satchel and say, I'm sorry, but I just had an emergency call. I'll have to leave. So you could either try to wait it out or come back another time. I see. And uh, in the area of Middle Street, uh, was there a meat market? Near Middle Street. Uh, the Shom? Shom? Oh yes, was Francis Shom was next with his meat market. And Mr. Shom did most of his own butchering. I know he cured his own hams. His sons the middle son and the youngest one took an active part helping him out in the store and the middle son was also Francis Shawn, but everybody in town called him Babe. And then Joe Burney also helped in there many times. Okay. And right in that general area was a bank? And the next was the First National Bank. Should I tell my story? Sure, tell your story. <laughs> when we wanted to build this home, we already had the lot and uh, paid for, so we decided one Friday night we were going to go up to ask for a loan. And when we went in, they asked what we wanted, and we said we wanted to speak to Mr. Hessen. And he made his appearance and said, come with me, and we went to his office. And in less than 15 minutes, we had our loan. And unlike today, he said, of course, you know you have to pay the interest on this loan, but you don't have any 
amount that you have to pay each month. Pay what you can. So we thought that was a wonderful Great setup, idea. and we were very happy that everything went so well there with Mr. Hessen. And you don't find those arrangements today. I'll say. And um, go ahead. There was a pharmacy close by? Only Town Pharmacy. Yes. And that was McKinney and later Hopkins. And here was something that I must have bought way back when. Here, it was that, a, uh, yeah. a pricey item. Yeah, 25 cents. <laughs> Oil of wintergreen. Yeah. Fine solution there. And I don't still know why I ever kept it. You can't get yeah. the lid off, but anyway. Yeah, still some of that left there. Yes, it indeed. was from there. Very good. And then um, in that area was a post office as the well? The next was the post office, and Jimmy Burke was the postmaster. We had a Mrs. Hitchcock that worked there every day. Then we had a Mr. Stonecipher that was there a lot of times, but when the post office was moved to Middle Street, Mr. Stonecipher became a permanent employee. Okay. And then there was a restaurant? And there was the Bumgarner Bakery, pool room and restaurant. On the left was the pool room and a snack bar. On the right is where you went in to buy the baked goods, and they had about four booze there if you wanted to sit down and have your treat there. He had a very limited menu, it was just like mostly sandwiches that you could buy and beverage. Okay. Very nice. And I also wanted to say that the Bumgarners had a fleet of trucks mm. that went to Westminster and all neighboring towns to the restaurants and the stores to deliver their baked goods. Very good. And then um, along your route was a jewelry store? Then right beside him was Louis Lancaster jewelry store and home where Flickinger's Barbershop had been just recently and he still lives there, Mr. Flickinger. But uh, Mr. Lancaster sold all types of jewelry, rings, bracelets, necklaces, and also did very good watch repair service. Okay. And as you're approaching the square, there was a clothing store? Right on the square of East Baltimore and Frederick Street was Hessen's department store. I never got in that store when it was owned by the Hessens, but I was told it was much like the Smith, only more merchandise and it had a second floor. Okay. Then later that became Ed Reed's grocery store and after Ed Reed in the 50s, early 50s, was Harry Dockerty and his wife Bessie had their grocery store there. Okay. So I guess now we'll cross the street at the hotel and we're going to come back um, towards your residence. Uh, well, the Central Hotel was run by John Leister and his wife Cora. But early in the 40s, Jimmy Bumgarner and his wife Elizabeth came back to town and they operated that through the 40s, 50s, even 60s, a very popular place. And I haven't mentioned yet Saturday night in Tawny Town. The streets were filled with people. If you didn't get here early, parking spaces were all gone on Middle Street, York Street, Frederick Street, and many times they were parked behind Trinity Lutheran. Mm -hmm. There was that many people in town at these stores and restaurants, like Central Hotel restaurant. Many times every seat was taken. You had to wait in the hallway, and there were steps right in the, in the door when you went there for the apartments upstairs. But a lot of times people were sitting on the steps waiting for their turn for a table. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? No, it sounds uh, like a hustle bustle back in the day. Nowadays it's not quite that uh, busy. I should say.
Then you came across uh, like an empty space between the hotel well, and the empty space in the summer months when the weather was favorable. Mary Anna Sell Hess, that was Mrs. David Hess. They would come every Friday evening and Saturday and set up their snowball stand. Big 50 pound chunks of ice. And I often saw both of them, Mr. and Mrs. Sell, set the stand up. He would carry the ice over and it was a manual ice shaver. But when it was set up, Mr. Hess always disappeared. And I thought, gee, why doesn't he stay and help his wife? Because that was a lot of work manually to make those snowballs. But they did have four children, so I guess he was needed at home. And she would always stand there hours on end shaving that ice. And she told me she made all her own flavorings. Mm. And I forgot to say, they were a nickel each. Very good. And then in that general area, there was a electric store? Yes, David Hilderbrick built what was called the Midtown Electric. And of course, now that space is empty entirely and it's parking for the town office. Okay. And then as you're coming back, uh, you come across the well, fire Well, then department. that's where the Tony Town, instead of town office, it was the Tony Town Fire Company. Right. And then uh, the barbershop came up? Then we came to Klingen's Barbershop, and he had a helper named Jeff Gills. And of course, that's where you got your first haircut. But Jeff opened up his own shop on Frederick Street in his house. Very good. And then after that, it became Ed Reed, who was on the square, and then his brother, Kermit Reed, opened up a meat and grocery store. Okay. And then was there another restaurant you come across? Oh, then it was David's. Davison's restaurant, which was a very popular spot for all the teenagers in town and even preteens. And Mr. Davison was so kind for us youngsters that went to the Rainbow Skating Rink because he would keep open every Sunday evening so that we would have a place to go for a snack and listen to his Nickelodeon. He had I guess the only Nickelodeon in Tawny Town. And that's where yours truly learned to dance. At the Davison's restaurant. Very nice. I forgot to say too that that was so popular when the Nickelodeon was going and the dancing, if you went up a small flight of stairs, it was a small space there, but it filled quickly. And the rest of us spilled out into the street. Hmm and was dancing on front of the restaurant. Wow. Then uh, there was a store that uh, uh, came by, Riffle oh, Store. Oh yes, Burt Riffle Store. That was a grocery store in the front and a restaurant and pool tables in the back. And Mr. Burt Riffle came every Saturday in his panel truck delivering groceries and ringing a large brass bell for your attention. It used to be along the curb and most everybody in town got used to Mr. Riffle's driving habits and we all, everybody was careful because when that customer was finished without looking in the rear view mirror, Mr. Riffle would just pull right out. Mm. And also his wife did baking. If you had called in advance, like early in the week, wanting a pie or cake or something, he would bring that along. And that truck, I can't remember that it had doors. I can always see Mr. Riffle sitting in there, but in the back, he had it fixed in a very good way for his canned goods. He had shelves about 12 inches wide and across the shelves then would be another piece of wood to keep the canned goods from falling on the floor. 
Hmm. And uh, b before you get to Mill Street, was there a telephone company? Oh yes, that was another large building, three-story building. The phone company was upstairs. You had to go to a flight of stairs on the left to get up to the phone company. There were several apartments up on that floor. Down on the ground floor to the left was a little bake shop and that was run by a Mr. Eckerd. And he didn't make bread because we already had one of those, but he made sticky buns and cookies and cupcakes and that type of thing. And he had two, I think it was two tables with some chairs if you wanted to sit down in there, but the space was very small. And then we had a Curdy Barris's little grocery store, but the main thing in Curdy Barris's store was that large glass penny candy place. Mm. And this was not Mr. Byers, this was from my father's store in Woodsboro, but this was the type of dish that the penny candy was in, and it used to be at least 12 or 15 of these in a row, and usually three deep, which made it very difficult to make your choice. And let me tell you, when you went in there after school, if you were lucky enough to have a nickel back in the 30s and early 40s, it uh, was quite a decision. Which one of those goodies did you want? He had a bench outside his store, and many times, if we didn't have to hurry home for any reason, we would sit there and make comparisons. What did you get and what did you get? And sometime they'd say, did you get one of these? And you'd say, no. Oh, you ought to have got one of those. And if it was wrapped in paper, many times we went back in and say, could you take this back and we'd rather have one of these? And they were very nice and left us do it. But you could only do that if the candy had a paper wrapper on it. Maybe you couldn't do that at all right now, but uh, right. because of the health, health concerns. Department. But uh, we did do that, and I guess too often. But Mr. Byers and a Mr. Devilbiss worked there that lived on West Baltimore Street, and he was there, I think, almost every day. And both of them, you would think they would kind of get a little cross people coming in, and it wasn't just one child, it might have been four or five right. wanting to trade for something else. I see. And then uh, along that route would be the bank. Well, let's see, after... Burning Trust. Yes, and it was Middle Street, right? Middle Street. Middle, and Middle Street, then it was the Bernie Trust Bank. And I never went into that bank. I can't remember going in there at all because we always dealt at the other one. And then we had the big opera house was next. And on the left was George Horner, a plumber, and the Carol Record. And I have a sample of how large that paper was. Of course it told everything about what was going on in Tawnytown, and this one happens to be 1897. I don't know how I managed to keep that all these years, but I did. And the main story was about Trinity Lutheran and the new addition to that. And it must have been quite a celebration because they had a service Friday evening, Saturday evening, and Sunday, according to this write-up. Mm, very interesting. And inside the opera house was a... Uh... Oh, I forgot to, too, to say that upstairs mm -hmm. we had vaudeville acts. One of the most popular was Happy Johnny and Dapper Dan. When they were in town, the opera house would be full. And it was also the practice place for the Junior IOOF band, which I was a member, and paid a snare drum.
Hmm. And Mr. Robert Menchie came from Hanover to give us lessons, and it would start early lessons, like right after school he'd have people come, and they cost 50 cents for a half hour. All right, so now we're down to around the railroad tracks. Now we're down to Gus Sestili, mm -hmm. and that was a, an Italian couple, and he was a shoe repair person. He had a big business because back then you didn't run and get a new pair of shoes every time the heels were run down or you had a hole in the sole because that was an expensive item. So he would take your shoes in and repair them. And he never said, what's your name? You always got a number. And then he would number your shoes. There was a counter to your left where all the shoes were lined up when he was finished. And that's where he did the work on your shoes. And his wife always had wonderful smelling Italian food cooking. And it was such a prominent odor that by the time if you were walking on that side, if you hit George Street, and even the leather and the other equipment that he used to repair the shoes, like if you had scuff marks, he had certain things he would put on to try to erase the scuff marks. I see. And uh, he was had a very good business. Sounds like it. So right before you get to George Street, was there a doctor's office? It was, uh, when I came here, it was a man named Dr. Martin. And when he left, Dr. McVaugh, took that space. Okay. And then we'll cross over George Street, then uh, was there a, like a car dealership of some sort? Yes, Oler's Garage and Chevrolet dealership. And the garage wasn't that large that he had models to show you like they do nowadays. He had pictures and you ordered your what car you would like. And later, when he went out of business, that became a supply place for the Cambridge rubber. They put their things in there. And okay. let's see. Very good. I wanted to mention that on Broad Street was Sell's Ice House. Mm. And that was where Mary Anna Sell Hess bought her ice for her business. And opposite the ice house was a sewing factory, Bornstein's Sewing Factory. I see. And part of that, right close to the uh, ice house, was there a doctor's office, uh, veterinarian? Oh, uh, yes. That was Dr. Hitchcock's veterinarian. And I guess in the late 40s or early 50s, American Legion home was there, and unfortunately, that big, beautiful Victorian brick house was torn down to make room for a gasoline station, which is still there at that sp at that spot. Okay. Okay. Just one and as we're. Uh Coming out about a half a mile from that location, at the uh, um, past your residence, actually at 428, uh, there was a Jack Newsbaum's uh, store. Is that correct? Yes, that was out the road quite a bit from the square. I guess it would be a mile. Was this little gasoline station and some groceries and an ice cream. Place, and that was owned by Jack Newsbaum. In fact, Jack built that little building, and that's still here. The last thing that was there was Grandma Jem's restaurant, but uh, right after Jack passed, his wife, Murdy, ran it for a good many years. And when she got too old to want to come over there, this son-in-law, Buzzy Bear, took it over for a good long period of time, I think he was there. I think he was there when you were small. Yes, he was. Yeah, buddy. Yes. Very good. So I guess that concludes...
Well, thank our you. journey for today. Thank you very much for your insight on all the businesses <laughs> that were here in Tawnytown back in the 30s oh, and 40s. You're quite welcome. Appreciate it. It's amazing how that all stays in my brain, how things were when we first arrived. Also, on this side of the street was there were no homes except the large white farmhouse that's on Bumgarner Avenue. This was all farmland, red barns, horses, cows, and Mr. Crumb that was right where now, let's see what's there. Uh, Mr. Glass has his business place, but that was the Crumb Farm. And right up from that was a brick house, Janet and Mary Smith. And that house now sits in the backyard of Antrim. It was moved one day. And by the way, I have a video of that moving. It was my second time to use that video, but I have the video of that house going over to Antrim. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your insight on everything that, <laughs> that happened in the 30s and 40s. Appreciate your time. Very good.